because if I just talked to you, we'd be here all day. So it's written down, no repetition, no hesitation, no interruption, but I take lots of questions afterwards, and I'm happy, in fact, I would like to read some poetry afterwards. There's poetry in the talk, of course, some of mine, a little bit of Dylan's and other people's. Um, last year was the big centenary, the Dylan Thomas centenary. Um, and I was supposed to come to the States last year, as well as going to lots of other places. I, I had a, uh, I've got a hole in my ear shaped like a rugby ball. Um, and, and that prevented me coming over. This talk, My Life with Dylan Thomas, some of it is true. <laughs> what you're looking at here is the cover of this, well, as you can see, substantial and major contribution to Dylan Thomas studies. This astonishing lithograph on the cover is by, in my opinion, the, the great 20th century British uh, uh, Welsh artist, Kerry Richards, also from Swansea. 1903, 1971, and in our modest way, my wife and I collect Kerry Richards. And one of the things I've done in the last few months, as you hear, Kerry met Dylan just once in the boathouse in Larne. Mark and I lent our Kerry Richards works to the boathouse. They've never gone back there. They're astonishing works, and of course, the tumbling figure under the, the owl that's flying in its beak a poetry manuscript under the unforgiving moon is Dylan tumbling into oblivion, which I shall do immediately after finishing this <laughs> talk. On the first day of Dylan's centenary, welcome. You missed the boring beginning bit, it's all right. <laughs> On the first day of Dylan's centenary year, I called in at his regular watering hole, the Boar's Head in Carmarthen. There would surely be a plaque, possibly details of a Dylan-themed weekend. The barman stared blankly back at me as I asked about Dylan and what they had planned. Nothing. It's Velen Boyle Brewery that owns it, he said. I think they might be missing a trick, I said. Can I get you anything, he said. I walked out into Lama Street, dark gate to the right, and directly across the road, the English Baptist Church loomed behind its narrow iron railing gates. Augustus John punched Dylan Thomas right here between alcoholic oblivion and the Bible-bound gaze of the Lord's people. Then, leaving the roaring boy flat on his back in the middle of the road, he bundled Dylan's future wife, Caitlin, and you can see he painted, he did a lot of things to Caitlin, including painting her, that's in the National Museum of Wales, bundled his future wife, Caitlin, into his car, and having his wicked way with the gearbox, drove off into the sunset towards Larne. I had four years at Swansea University, when it was called the University College of Swansea, going up in the autumn, the fall of 65. A degree in English and a PGCE year, a PGCE year that's teacher training year. Plenty of exposure to Dylan Thomas then. No. Thomas was not mentioned at all by any of our lecturers, even on the modern British and American course for which I'd opted. He died 13 years before, so perhaps it was all a bit raw. Kingsley Amis had just left the staff, and no doubt they'd had too much of larger-than-life writers. Though the English Society did have a steady trickle of fascinating guests. The Irish poet W. R. Rogers, the suave and seductive Danny Absey, more of Danny later, who was handsome and read poems you could understand. <laughs> There was also a reading by Kathleen Rain, another poet invited to do a reading tour of America by John Malcolm Brennan, though hardly in the staggering steps of Dylan. 
She was impressively mystifying and spoke of recognizing only true poets such as Vernon. She was the guest of Vernon Watkins, who in the academic year 66-67 had been invited to the university as Gulbenkian Fellow. Recently retired as the oldest bank clerk in Wales, my father was the youngest bank manager. He was assigned to our modern British and American literature course. The trouble was that Vernon, whilst obviously not American by birth or inclination, was also problematically British and certainly not modern. He declared that he could never write a poem that was dominated by time. In his poetry world, there could be nothing modern, only ancient truths. Kathleen Rain said that, with certainty, he walked on holy ground. Well, the group of 10 or so of us rapidly fell away from our allotted weekly sessions with Watkins. He was not a natural teacher of groups, and it was difficult to see how what he was going on about would help us with our end of year exams. Some weeks it was a girl and me, and some weeks just me and Vernon. The small poet buds were in me, though I dared not give any indication of this to the Gulbenkian fellow, and I felt honored to sit at his feet or on the same bench on campus or in Singleton Park in Swansea. That was so long ago, and in truth I remember little of what was said, except that here was a Faber poet, a close friend of Dylan Thomas, who had shared drafts of poems with each other, made suggestions and corrections to each other's work, and for whose wedding in 1944, Dylan had not shown up. That was bad, but doubly bad because Dylan was supposed to be the best man. <laughs> I certainly had no confidence to show Vernon Watkins my work. Years later, I learned that the fine poet and filmmaker John Ormond had done this when he was an undergraduate at Swansea. The strictures and precise critiquing of his work were so severe that John was shaken from his course as a poet for some years. Don't publish anything until you are 30, Vernon had said. What would Vernon Watkins have made of my student scribblings? I'd had a narrow escape. I do remember Watkins talking with insight and enthusiasm about the war poet Wilfred Owen. And on the one occasion that I asked him about Dylan Thomas, he announced, Dylan, of course, was a Christian poet. Discuss. <laughs> in an interview with George Thomas broadcast on BBC Radio in February that year, Vernon Watkins said, I find the students very interesting. I can't say how good I am as a teacher. All I can say is that I think I learn a lot from doing it. How much they learn is anyone's guess. Well, learning comes in many ways. And I was, though largely uncomprehending, gripped by his every word. My last memory of Vernon Watkins was seeing him on one of the college's tennis courts. He was still a wiry, athletic man into his 60s, quite the antithesis to podgy, chain-smoking, beer-drinking Dylan Thomas. Though just as Dylan had died in America, so would Vernon Watkins, later that fall, 66. He had gone on from Swansea to a year as visiting professor in Washington, Seattle, on the recommendation of the recently departed and great American poet, Theodore Redke. That August vacation, while I was working shifts in the sun-blessed bread factory in Saltney, North Wales, pursuing my future wife, incidentally, as well as making some bread. <laughs> Vernon, against his doctor's advice, continued to play tennis and had a heart attack. Dylan dead from a succession of whiskies and medical blunders. Vernon dead from too much sport. <laughs> one of the works that we have and one of the works that 
Kerry Richards did, as well as being paying homage to uh, to Dylan. Uh, uh, Kerry Richards was was a close friend of Vernon Watkins later, and this elegy for Vernon Watkins, Vernon Watkins, Vernon Watkins was a uh, uh, one of the many great works that he did. When we were in college, of course, I took Margaret down to meet my gran in Pentrevelling Street, Carmarthen. She was welcoming and fed two hungry students with a full roast and pudding. Did she remember anything of Dylan Thomas and his times in the town, I asked. Well, what I do know is that wife of his, Caitlin, was no better than she should have been. <laughs> I was born in Grand's house on Boxing Day, 1946. That year was a good one for Dylan, with the appearance of Deaths and Entrances, great book of poetry, in February. Dent, the publisher, printed 3,000 copies as the first edition. Also in 1946, there were no fewer than 52 broadcasts and recordings for the BBC and other people. On the first full day of my life, on the 27th of December, <coughs> Dylan read The Crumbs of One Man's Year as the Today Talk following the evening news on the BBC. 20 guineas. His broadcast and recording earnings alone for 1946 came to over 620 guineas. Not pounds, mind. Guineas. That's what a proper poet should be paid. Susan, take note. <laughs> yeah, I don't have to patronize you by telling you what a guinea is, do I? Yeah, you do. Yeah. Yes. A pound and a shilling. Oh. All the great horse races in Britain are called the 1,000 guineas, the 2,000 guineas. A pound and a shilling. A gentleman's bill has always come in guineas, not pounds. I'm almost certain that my mother, father, and grand grandmother would not have been listening to that broadcast of Dylan Thomas. I had been a breech birth, and both I and my mother were lucky to survive, thanks to Nurse Evans, who had been sent for to come to the house on Boxing Day. What a tear. In truth, that talk, the crumbs of one man's ear, was an accurate description of a pot boiler of a piece. Dylan Thomas doing a very good and slightly malicious imitation of himself. That was the judgment of Martin Armstrong in The Listener. If those in number five, Pentamelli Street, had heard Dylan say, this is from the talk, of what is coming in the new year, I know nothing, except that, it is, that all that is certain will come like thunderclaps or like comets in the shape of four leaves. Clovers. Would they have had a premonition that my grandfather in Lancashire was dying? That my mother would have to take the train from Carmarthen to leave me to see him and be stuck up there for weeks in the worst winter snowfall and big freeze in living memory? That I would be reared by my granny in that council house for the first three months of my life? And that I'm still trying to work out what that meant? There's Dylan at the BBC with Douglas Cleverdon, a great uh, supporter of his. And uh, that is another poet. This is a chronological, or as we, that's the posh, in Wales we say it's all over the bloody place. <laughs> in the early 1970s, while teaching in Cheshire, Margaret and I started a series of literary evenings in a pub. The George and Dragon in Northwich, with the support of the Northwest Arts Association. It had a starry guest list. John Arden, the playwright. Tony Connor, the poet. George Macbeth, the presenter of the BBC Poetries Now, with a purring Scottish Oxford accent. A wavy-haired young novelist called Melvin Bragg. Don't know what happened to him. And John Putney. Now, I'd always been moved by Pudney's short war poem, For Johnny. This man wrote and edited over 50 books, 
13 of them in the war alone. But he was destined to be best remembered for just 12 lines of a poem, which would catch the moment, the importance of the Battle of Britain, and the survival of you know, democracy, of course. Pudney, do not despair for Johnny head in air. He sleeps as sound as Johnny underground. Fetch out no shroud for Johnny in the cloud and keep your tears for him in after years. Better by far for Johnny the bright star to keep your head and see his children fed. And of course that is what the election of a Labour government and the throwing out of our hero Winston Churchill achieved for Britain straight after the war. That poem featured in the 1945 film, A Way to the Stars, and it was spoken in that film by the, the great actor Michael Redgrave. Now, John Pudney had stood for Parliament as a Labour candidate and had married the daughter of A.P. Herbert, an independent MP. Herbert, uh, uh, Pudney, had been a school friend of W.H. Auden and Benjamin Britten at Gresham School. I didn't know any about any of this, but he had a meal with us before the reading, and he talked about his friend, Dylan Thomas. They'd both been part of literary London from the late 1930s, and in 1942, A.P. Herbert, persuaded by John Putney, had supported Dylan and Kathleen by letting them live in one of the two houses he owned in Chiswick. One of the stories we heard concerned Dylan's dress code. It was not unknown for Dylan, I'm, I'm fearful of reading this bit because I'm staying with a, a, a friend tonight <laughs> in your area. It was not unknown for Dylan to wash up at somebody's flat after a heavy night. And this happened to Pudney several times. Late one morning, he re John Pudney returned to find Dylan eventually gone, along with a shirt and a pair of John's best trousers. <laughs> That afternoon, he spotted Dylan holding forth with cronies in the Café Royal. John approached and waited for an opportunity to have a quiet word about the trousers. <laughs> um, Dylan, perhaps if I could just have you see... What? The, um, the trousers, my trousers... Hey! Well, I think that possibly a mistake has... You may be wearing my trousers, Dylan. At which point, the roaring boy drew himself up to his five foot six above average height for a Welshman and started unbuttoning. Do you want them now? He bellowed. John Pudney quietly withdrew. It's all right, uh, Hanlin, you're not my size. <laughs> So that was Dylan Thomas's dress code. When yours wear out or become too dirty, take somebody else's. In my first, first two years as, as a high school teacher in Wimslow Boys Grammar School in Cheshire, you can imagine how rough that was, I was also the reviews editor of a small magazine run from Liverpool by a Swansea University contemporary of ours. I was sent copies of the Peterloo Phoenix Pamphlet Poet Series, which had included Seamus Heaney, Derek Mahon, and Michael Longley, the were three great contemporary Irish poets. It was an indication of the enthusiasm and energy of this man, the editor Harry Chambers, that he would bother to send review copies to an obscure little magazine with a readership you could have counted on both hands and one foot. Not only that, but he wrote later to thank me for my warm review. Within weeks, and we're talking snail mail here, not computers, right? I had followed up by sending him a selection of my poems and had been accepted as the 18th and final Phoenix Pamphlet Poet. My booklet, Soft and Hardbound, <laughs> appeared in 1971. It was called Walk Down a Welsh Wind. <laughs> oh, come on, I was young. <laughs> And in one of my poems, an old rum of a seagull
bunches his neck, buff feathered into his shuffling body, muffled round with cold as he picks along the curling line of water. Well, noisy echoes of Dylan there. When I recently Googled this title, it was available for 94 pounds, not kidding, 94 pounds from a dealer in South End. And from an American seller, at 15 bucks. <laughs> the Seamus Heaney booklet, which I have, signed, is at $1,200. Dylan Thomas was one of the first popular poets of the broadcast and recording age. He gave numerous talks, as I've said, and readings on the BBC and featured in recordings of other people's work, including Vernon Watkins. <laughs> the best band never turned up. Vernon Watkins' Ballad of the Mary Lloyd, one of the, one of, a great, one of the great Welsh poems in English. Dylan performed the leader of the dead in, in that poem on, on the BBC. He even appeared on BBC TV in a programme in April 1953. Remember the date? With Winford, Winford Vaughan Thomas, Dan Jones, Fred James, and Vernon Watkins. But as with so many treasures of those early days, the TV tape and the Mary Lloyd recording were both wiped for reuse. As for the television program, perhaps that was for the best. As Werner Watkins later said, Dylan couldn't quite remember his words. <laughs> of course, we have those treasures, the Cadman recordings, and two young American students, Barbara Holdrich and Marianne Mantell, to thank for those recordings. The records they produced have not only provided a steady income for the Dylan Thomas estate, quite considerable actually, but it was Holdridge and Mantell, not the Swansea Council, who paid for the memorial stone to Dylan by Ronald Corr in Cumdonkey Park in Swansea in 1963. Those two women are, you know, in the pantheon of great supporters of the arts, those two, those two American students, as I think they were then. And you can get, and some of you may have, a box set of everything Dylan Thomas ever recorded. It's wonderful, of course. It's about $40, it's ridiculous. Go on Amazon or whatever and, and get it. Um, Ronald Corr, the sculptor, was the husband of Glenis Corr, and I'm staying in Hanlon Davis's house in New Haven at the moment, and he has, a, he was taught by Glenis Corr in Swansea, he has a Glenis Corr, we have one, we have one in our toilet, it'll match it. Um, <laughs> Glenis Corr still appears, I'm on the executive of the Contemporary Art Society, where Glenis Corr at 91 still turns up in astonishing hats, and is still painting like a train, she's wonderful, absolutely wonderful. Well, that's by her husband, uh, Ronald. So if you go to Swansea and you go to Cumdonkin Park, boys, I was young and easy in the mercy of his means, time held me. On May the 14th, jumping around here, on May the 14th, 1991, I got a call from the Welsh Academy of Writers. I'd been chair of the Welsh Academy of Writers for six years in the 1980s. The famous American poet, Lawrence Ferlinghetti, come to Cardiff and wanted to visit Dylan's boathouse in Larne. Would I take him down and look after him for the day? As you folks over here say, are you kidding? <laughs> I picked him up in Cathedral Road in Cardiff. He had as his companion a foxy redhead somewhere in her prime. <laughs> At the boathouse he left me on the path to the writing shed with a view of the estuary I, I, I'm the one on the left. <laughs> and he left me uh, at the writing shed with a view of the estuary and the town and the foxy lady. We admired the view and spotted what could have been a heron. Actually, if you go to the boat as you don't see a heron, you get your money back. <laughs> we, we've been, as I said, we, we did a curated an art show there recently. You always see a heron. It's magical. I know. Herons you see all over the place. We saw loads on the train to from New York. But, uh, but, but one of Dylan Thomas's herons. <laughs> Lawrence Fillingetti returned with a notebook. It was obvious that he'd written a poem. Back in the bed and breakfast, 
in Cathedral Road. I interviewed him and later included that in my book, How Poets Work, which my publisher, Saren, had published most of my books, uh, published in 1996. Now, Lawrence Phil and Getty had met Dylan Thomas in America. I heard him twice in San Francisco, he said. Both times he was quite lushed up. <coughs> And there was no doubt about the impact he made. Phil and Getty said, the oral tradition which Thomas carried forward when he read was fantastic for many of the local San Francisco poets there. Dylan Thomas had a very definite effect on the San Francisco Renaissance, which began in the early 1950s, when the beat poets arrived from New York. I'm talking about Allen Ginsberg, Gregory Corso, William Burroughs, Jack Kerouac, Jack Kerouac and the others that my little publishing house ended up publishing. You bet he did. <laughs> Lawrence also said that Allen Ginsberg had made a pilgrimage to Larne later. He paid homage to Dylan Thomas. Ginsberg came to Wales and wrote a long poem of his own at Fern Hill. He happened to write it on LSD, but it's a wonderful long poem. One master recognizes another. Indeed. In fact, at a recent exhibition in the National Museum, <coughs> Museum in Wales, uh, there was a, there's a video of, 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 um, of Ginsberg, and he reads that, that poem in homage to Dylan and in homage to Wales. And I can, if you can dig that out online, it's, it's, well worth, uh, it's, it's well worth exploring. That's Fern Hill. That is actually going on. You cannot schedule ghosts or the significant presences of places. Cumdonkin Park, Dylan's house, which is now a memorial to him. The Fitzroy pub in London. The Chelsea Hotel in Manhattan, which we visited a couple of days ago. It's derelict, as is its sole occupant, a lovely lady with no teeth on the settee saying, ah, I've lived here for 34 years, they can't get me out. I think they're going to turn it into a pharmacy or something. That's where Dylan had the 18 straight whiskeys and then oblivion, right? But as our dear friend Danny Apsey has said, your constant preparedness for a poem has got to be there. Wherever you are, signif apparently significant or insignificant place, if you're a real poet, the lines are open. All you can do is remain open to the possibilities. Not chase the poems, but let them come to you. And when the moment comes to recognize that for what it is, it could be Fern Hill, or in my case, it could be St. Clair's, the next village to learn. And this incident. This is my poem, Turning. Stopping for salt marsh lamb from Anan's purveyors of fine meats on the Blue Boar Bridge in the center of St. Clair's, if you had not turned to double-check the car, that heron priesting the river would have remained in the blue-gray shade of overhanging trees, statuesque, dabbing into the cunning's shallow, pebbly flow. An unwitnessed river lord, before turning and loping into the air, larnwards, spreading his black, gray, and white surplus against the sky. You've got to be in the right place, looking in the right direction. And, you know, it was, it was all right, a couple of miles down the road from Lana, but that heron uh, was put there for us, I think. On Poetry Day in 2013, because Britain has a poetry day. And why it's on October the 3rd, and why isn't every day a poetry day, I don't know. <laughs> on BBC 4's Today programme, and all the chattering classes, anyone who's got you know, half a degree listens to Radio 4, and listens to the Today programme. On that morning, they had Prince Charles reading Dylan Thomas's Fern Hill. You can get it online, right? What a pleasant surprise at 8.40 in the morning, I was later informed. I'm gainfully retired and don't rise before noon. 